Good day, dear students. Today, we are uh, reaching the final phase of methodology of literature and coming to a close uh, of all those we have been uh, going through. And uh, actually, this chapter is, the section is a summary of what you had learned previously. So uh, it takes a bit longer. But at the same time, because it is a revision of what we had done earlier, I think it will be much easier for you to follow. Hope you will remember all the other classes. The topic which we have to study, start with now, is new historicism. And this is actually uh, a return to history. The main person or the one who uses this term or introduces the term is Stephen Greenblatt in his book Renaissance Self-Fashioning from Moore to Shakespeare. Uh, this book was published in the year 1980 and uh, the term New Historicism refers to a reading practice that includes historical cultural context of a text. That is a book which had been published years back. And when you read the book, maybe you really enjoy the book. But when you read it in connection with the history that has been or the situation of the uh, time when it was written and also the cultural context of that particular text, it makes you... Uh, proper or a deeper understanding of the text and it may reveal certain things which were not revealed to you at the first reading of the text. So new historicism refers to a reading practice and this reading practice is based on history and cultural uh, terms. Greenblatt finds the term quite a problematic one because he says New historicism is a return to history, the cultural and social context within which literatures are produced. Though we have a later theory which says that uh, it is not necessary to judge a work of art uh, to understand the personal life of a person, personal life of the author, this uh, new historicism takes into consideration not just the history, but the cultural and social context within which literatures are produced. When you see the examples, which we'll, uh, uh, which I'll tell you later, you will clearly understand what uh, is meant by the cultural and social context. So we have new historicism, and of course there is an uh, there was an old historicism. And the old historicism is history is the background against which literature was foregrounded. Of course, uh, literature which is uh, based on uh, history or historical uh, writings or history taken as such and made into literature. Maybe a little bit of um, uh, art or even imagination is also put into that. That is old historicism. But new historicism is the reading of the text based on in the background of history plus culture. And um, the term or the new historicism as a theory, it was much influenced by Frederick Nietzsche and his work on the uses and disadvantages of history for life and also the names which are worth mentioning, Gre Clifford Geertz, then M Michel Foucault, Louis Althusser, and all these are names that you have come across. Maybe Clifford Geertz was not there, but Foucault and Althusser, you have uh, learned at least a little bit of their theory regarding whatever it is that we have studied. 
Nietzsche, in his book, rejects the dominant modes of historiography. Uh, because there was a dominant mode which was existent at that time. And so naturally he is not for that. Geertz, on the other hand, says culture is sets of signifying systems. Because that culture is just a marking system or signifying systems, which makes sense in the literature produced at that time. Foucault is of the opinion that there is a relationship between power and knowledge. So Foucault is uh, inquiring uh, the uh, power and knowledge or the relationship between power and knowledge. Then histories are disconnected range of discursive practices. So this is again another uh, knowledge that we gain from the uh, philosophies that has come across. Then discourses of an era produces knowledge and knowledge is always a weapon for power. You have, of course, discourses of an era, like for example, the Elizabethan era, and you have a lot of writings from that particular era. You have a little bit of prose, you have a lot of drama and poetry, and uh, this produces knowledge about that particular age and that knowledge is always power. Knowledge is power, something that we have already learned. And it is a weapon of power. And when I say that knowledge is power, we take it to mean that this power will help you to go uh, or uh, go up in the uh, life, in your life. But in a way, this uh, knowledge as power is a weapon in the hands of certain political uh, people or even uh, the people who really want to assume power or to have power over other people. This is why it is the statement is quite deceptive. It's not a personal statement. It is a general statement which we'll examine in the uh, next section. Let's check what uh, Louis Althusser uh, has to speak of. You have uh, learned about Louis Althusser in the earlier classes, uh, in classes 12 and 13. You have already learned elaborately his theories and his opinions concerning Marxism and also about literature. So he is of the opinion that literature is the manifestation of an ideology and ideology subjects or subordinates the individual to the interests of the dominant classes. So, literature is a manifestation of ideology and it subordinates the individual to the interests of the dominant classes. Raman Saldan et al. analyzes the works of the main new historicists and he sums up, or the others uh, altogether, they uh, sum up the main points. You have four points mentioned in your text. It is there in the in pages 149 and 150. You are to refer to that and go through it one after the other. What we have uh, spoken of, you will find summarized in those four points. A reader is positioned by the conditions and ideological formations of his or her era. Of course, whatever that you read now conditions you to form an opinion or an ideology about the uh, times that you live in or the era that you uh, live in. If there is a conformity between the author and reader, it is called naturalization. The conformity between the author and the reader in the sense that if the reader agrees with or conforms to the ideas expressed by the author in the text of literature, then we call that as naturalization. The absence of the conformity is a case of appropriation to make it conform to the cultural prepositions. So suppose you do not agree with the uh, ideas expressed by the author in literature, then it is a case of appropriation, which means that to make it 
conform to the cultural prepossessions whatever that is there you have to conform and uh, the, be there uh, as part of the cultural prepossessions aram uh, visa in his anthology new historicism offers five key assumptions regarding new historicism these are all assumptions okay so those assumptions are uh, uh, written down or it is uh, there in the pages 150 go through it one after the other and you will find these assumptions one after the other in a way gives you an idea as to what new historicism is doing and why it is necessary to have a deeper reading of the text in order based on history or in the historical background and the cultural milieu and only then you will get to know what the author means by his text and it is these assumptions that you will find in page 150 do please check those uh, that page and also the five key assumptions you will also find that earlier i told you that we have examples you find that uh, renaissance and the romantic period fascinated new historicists in the usa renaissance was the reawakening of knowledge knowledge was taken from the closet and it was spread among the people and uh, the, that reawakening that period is called renaissance you have already learned about renaissance and its after effect not only in england but also the world over and the other uh, period which fascinated the new historicists um, in usa is the romantic period then again you come back to stephen greenblatt and renaissance self-fashioning he had also written another book called shakespearean negotiations in 1988 and uh, uh, he is uh, in a way you find that there is another essay uh, called essays in uh, early modern culture in the, uh, published in the year 1990 and louis montrose the subject of elizabeth focuses on virgin queen so um, you have the romantic period where you have Jerome Magan, Merlin Butler, Marjorie Levin, uh, Levinson all speaking about uh, the romantic period and E.M. Uh, Tilliard speaking about the Elizabethan world picture representative of all historicism. Literature of any period expresses the spirit of the age. For example, it is, let's take Shakespearean plays and you have already learned uh, one shakespearean play you have learned about not just the play but also about shakespeare the times he lived in elizabethan england everything and it reflects the ideas of divine order which is a key feature of the elizabethan period you have already learned british history where the kings told the people that it is by divine order that the king is chosen and if there is a divine order people will never oppose that person becoming the king so that idea of the divine order was instilled into the mind of the people and it is that key feature of the elizabethan uh, period and shakespeare's plays reflect this particular idea and this is why you will find that regicide, killing of the king, is uh, something that is considered to uh, actually doing a harm to the uh, to God Himself. So it is. This is why uh, you have learned Macbeth, of course. And uh, I'll take an example from Macbeth. So you find that um, the king was killed and whatever be his faults or whatever be the nature it is portrayed as regicide and as such a lot of things befall the person who had killed the king and evil comes upon that person and so the idea that the upsetting of the divine order brings in a lot of curse on that person and this is instilled into the mind of the people through literature so we have to regard Macbeth in that, uh, in, on that level 
and you will find that this is a feature of the Elizabethan period and uh, Shakespeare's plays also reflect the same idea because he is a, a person from that particular age and the spirit of the age was that no one ever thought of quarreling with that idea did you because this is the accepted norm like for example you can't criticize certain things and nowadays you you can criticize anything and everything and there is no limit to that but in those days people believed they were much docile and they uh, uh, believed the teachings of the church and also of the elders and continued in that vein and accepted king as the father of the nation and he was appointed not by the people but by the divine intervention and so it was the divine order so who can quarrel with the divine order no one can that's god's plan this is what they believed so you uh, if you are fighting against it then you are fighting with god so that kind of an uh, uh, the idea was instilled into the mind of the people so a reading of the text in that particular light will reveal a lot of things so uh, m w tilliard published this book uh, in the year 1943 and you know that it was several years after more than 400 years after shakespeare's england and a reading from this 20th century uh the elizabethan uh, text reveals a lot of things so new historicists takes it as hegemony so here you find that it is indeed uh, a new historicist uh, takes it as hegemony means uh, it is the imposing of the power on the authority over the people and the new historicism is a historical project historical project means a uh, reading rereading of the history we have already read the text produced at that time like the shakespearean play we have understood a lot of things but you are reading deeper and it is that project or it is in that historical terms that it is taken new historicism is taken all old historicism is just historical means uh, a text which is based on history like for example macbeth it's a scottish history it is based on scottish history and uh, there uh, there was an event like that and it is projected and al along with that a lot of things a drama is added to that and you have a beautiful play by shakespeare a great tragedy and this is uh, adhering to certain norms or certain historical facts not much more than that so here you find that uh the people they believe in the faithful record of the past or new historicism believes in the faithful record of the past faithful record of the past means not new criticism old historicism which is historical it believes in the faithful record of the past means uh, without changing anything without uh, making any change to the historical uh, incidents which happened they just uh, recorded and that is uh, what they had been doing Peter Barry in his famous book Beginning Theory I've been mentioning this book a lot of times and I'm sure that you are familiar with the Peter Barry and Beginning Theory and for anything and everything you will find it because you are learning methodology of literature Peter Barry is the authoritative text you will find almost everything there so in Beginning Theory he lists the strategy of an Uh, of new historicist critics the strategy employed by new historicist critics and this is recorded as uh, it is summarized as just four points and for that you refer to the pages 152 and 153 okay so you find new historicism which is a read, reading rereading of the texts which were produced at a certain age and understanding the cultural and historical background uh, uh, in which that text was written and getting to know a deeper understanding of the people who lived at that time and what they believed in and this is a look from the present to the past okay so this is why new historicism is important the next topic is cultural materialism when you uh, come across the term cultural materialism you find that the term was coined by raymond williams 
and it studies the implication of texts in history. And moreover, it is committed to the transformation of a social order which exploits people on the grounds of race, gender and class. It is different from new historicism on three areas, that is in attitude, in theory and in practice. Mind you, this um, uh, cultural materialism is uh, uh, committed to the transformation of a social order which exploits social order can be kingship or uh, any political parties ruling anything. But it exploits people on the grounds of race, gender and class. Race, gender and class. All these form culture. And even then they are differentiated or they are in a way exploited by these pe by the people. Then it is different from new historicism. Why? Because in its attitude, in theory and also in practice, they are really uh, different. Terence Hawkes, that Shakespearean drag juxtaposes Shakespeare and the circumstances in which one encounters him. Catherine Bell says the subject of tragedy, uh, it has got uh, the theme of subjectivity and identity of Elizabethan drama as well as popular ballads. Ballads means um, the story, long narrative story poems, then uh, conduct books, political proclamations and legal documents. So the uh, Subjectivity means uh, the personalization and identity of Elizabethan drama. This is what she, Catherine Belsey, uh, studies, as well as popular ballads, ballads which are popular, and the background, why these ballads were constructed. Then conduct books, how to conduct yourself, how to behave, the manners and mannerisms and what all things, whatever that is there, and uh, the political proclamations of that particular time and also examining the legal documents. So whatever legal documents that were preserved and had been handed over to the uh, generations that come after. And mind you, this book was published in the year 1985. But from all these, you get a totally different picture of Elizabethan England and the way the uh, rulers treated people based on their race and uh, also uh, their culture uh, and their gender and also uh, the class, the class to which they belonged. Again, you have another important book called Fault Lines, published in the year 1992 by Alan Sinfield, John Drakakis, Alternative Shakespeare, uh, then literary texts like dr Renaissance drama. They are also examined to recover the uh, histories or the lost histories, the history which was lost at a certain time and which is being pulled out. Because when you write history at a time, and the ruling person is uh, not tarnished with a, with a brush uh, because it is uh, his good points are highlighted. No one will ever think of uh, um, writing a history with the king, with the ruling king looking on or maybe from, uh, from there. And so maybe they are afraid to place history in the right sense. So it is that history which is lost will be recovered by the cultural materialists. Then uh, the next topic is postmodernism. Because it is postmodernism, we know that it comes after modernism. You have already learned about modernism. And now we are going to learn more about postmodernism. And let's see what all things are uh, included under this title. Origin of this term, most postmodernism, is uh, late 20th century. You know that you are living in the 21st century. So the origin of uh, postmodernism is 20th century means maybe after 1950s. <clears throat> and uh, applicable to literature, art, architecture, cinema, and so on. Then it questions realism, rejects truth, but proposes truths. Okay, rejects truth, but rejects proposes truths. Then 
there is it is put in single inverted commas which is the watchword of postmodernism and that is fragmentation of the life world these are the features at least uh, the main features okay then john uh, sean francois lotard uh, had written a book called the postmodern condition a report on knowledge this was published in the year 1979 and uh, there is uh, uh, Christi uh, calls christianity liberalism marxism and so on as meta narratives meta narratives means narratives on narratives this is what we call as meta narratives like uh, the religion christianity then liberalism then marxism all three are uh, and a lot more we, he calls as meta narratives then in just gaming 19 which was published in the year 1979 it suggests anti foundationalism which is a rejection of the idea that there are foundations to our system of thought or belief that lie beyond question that is there are there are foundations to our system of thought the way you think is already preconditioned conditioned earlier who says that maybe you can break through that so you find that there is a rejection of the idea that there are foundations to our system of thought or belief that lie beyond question because questioning was not done at that uh, earlier now in postmodern condition we are questioning all those preconceived idea or notions of thought belief and uh, the uh, and things that are uh, unquestionable then john bodley uh, bodley has got an idea or his theory it is called simulations which is published in the year 1981 and uh, another book called a critique of the political economy of the sign published in the same year he extends his arguments to media studies uh he and describes the postmodern world as a world of simulacra where it is impossible to differentiate between reality and simulation that is loss of the real this is called simulacrum okay so here bodley simulations is now really popular you will find a lot of uh, things which are the loss of the real world and uh, maybe there is an imaginary world and we would like to lose yourself into that imaginary world so uh, he describes uh, especially in the media studies he describes the postmodern world as a world of simulacra where you don't uh, you are not able to differentiate between what is reality and what is simulation what is being prompted on and so there is a loss of the real loss of the real world and uh, the uh, which he terms as simulacrum because you will find this um, a lot of this like for examples you have um, i don't know whether you read a, lo a lot you have the harry potter stories of course it is my, much 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 latest we know that it's not a reality but at the same time there is a touch of reality somewhere you lose yourself in the world of magic and then again you find certain writers writing and uh, again uh, uh, about um, uh, a world where you find a play of the present and maybe the imagination or the other world so there is the simulated world simulation means that which is being prompted by something and uh, there is a reality and uh, you don't know whether this is real or whether the other one is simulation that kind of a uh, uh, difference uh, the difficulty is there for the reader so as you read on you feel that it is indeed real and you are so deep into it that you find to find uh, you fail to find a demarcation between reality and simulation this uh, bodley calls as loss of the real which he gives the term to which he gives the term simulacrum so you find four stages for the simulacrum and those four stages are uh, elaborately uh described in the page 10158 students 
do please go through it because that will give you a proper understanding of the uh, four stages of simulacrum and also the way it is done or the different stages and uh, which is again part of postmodernism then uh, it also links simulation to hyper reality that is not reality but hyper reality again frederick jameson's essay on postmodernism or cultural logic of late capitalism uses ernest Man mandel's uh, late capitalism and raymond williams cultural moments dominant emerging and residual all these are used in frederick jameson's essay on postmodernism so here you find that there is indeed a lot of things that are uh, really worth understanding and you will also find that uh, simulation, uh, the uh, link to simulation and that simulation is linked to hyper-reality and uh, hyper-reality is again part of postmodernism because as I told you earlier, uh, postmodern world is the aftermath of the world that came into existence after the two world war. So people had lost a lot. It is a time of rebuilding. And even then, people are not sure whether the world that they are building will ever stand alone because at any moment they expect a third world war. So naturally, there is no uh, reality for them. And this hyper-reality, this uh, made-up reality is seen in almost all the writings which came during that time. You will find a lot of changes. Uh, coming up and fragmentation is again part and parcel of uh, postmodernism fragmentation means uh, the different fragments they present different fragments and those fragments you can uh, join together and make it one whole or you can read it as fragments alone the best example is Doris Lessing's novel The Golden Notebook there you find Doris Lessing is a Nobel Prize winning writer and she had written an, uh, a, a book called The Golden Notebook in which Anna is the main, Anna Wolf is the main person and in the introduction uh, to this book uh, Doris Lessing says it is divided into different notebooks and you can read it as different notebooks or you can read it as uh, just one whole it is up to you but it is not actually a feminist reading because a woman is writing doesn't mean that uh, she is a feminist and whatever that she believes in she has her own ideas about it so the whole book is divided into different chapters that is one chapter is red notebook another is a blue notebook then the other uh, then there is uh, another uh, notebook called uh, the black notebook then there is a yellow notebook and uh, in between you find uh, a lot of uh, uh, chapters entitled called free women one free women two things like that so uh, after reading the one notebook you are confused because the second is another notebook and uh, you find uh, uh, free woman uh, not, uh, free wo free women uh, chapter coming in between so naturally you read that also and after that you come across a blue notebook you read that also only later and uh, only after reading all these uh, notebooks one after the other you understand that blue notebook tells you about something red notebook tells you about something black notebook continuously tells you about something and the yellow notebook again tells you something in between you have the story proper narrated in free women one two three etc so that is the story of anna wolf that is free women one two three four anna and molly and their story but what about these notebooks it is the way uh, anna wolf had compartmentalized her life black notebook is her life in africa she was in africa earlier and she came over to england much later so her memory of whatever that happened to her and to her friends in africa she had put under the title black notebook because africa is a black continent maybe because of that she had given the title black notebook so in the, if you read all the black notebooks together you will get to know what happened to her or what her life was in africa the red notebook is again uh, a notebook which tells you about 
the involvement of Anna and her friend Molly with the Communist Party. And so the Communist Party is the symbol as such is taken as red. So she was a member of the Communist Party in Africa. So whatever that they did in Africa, she wrote, uh, she put it under the title. And not just in Africa, in England also. And the world over, what is happening to communism the world over, all these paper cuttings including, she had put under the title the red notebook. Then comes the blue notebook. Anna is a writer. And she suddenly encountered a writer's block. So somebody recommended a psychoanalyst. So she goes to a psychoanalyst and the uh, psychoanalyst makes a talk. And the talking was painful because she is uh, unknowingly, because there is a uh, listener, she starts talking and all the painful memories that she had tried to suppress in her life comes out. And so it is a painful one hour for her. So she continuously, she went there uh, for some time and that block was removed. She was able to write. It is a painful experience going there and meeting the psychoanalyst. She calls the psychoanalyst Mother Sugar because it is a painful pill and you need it to be sugar coated. Okay, so Mother Sugar is the title that she gives to the uh, psychoanalyst. But it, she knows that it is necessary because she really wants to uh, continue writing. So that experience of going and there and talking to her, she had put under the title the blue notebook. Blue color, blue is something personal, self. So it is there. All her stories you will find there, especially this particular aspect you find in the blue notebook. What about the yellow notebook? The yellow notebook, as I told you, uh, Anna is a writer. So all her writings, her short stories, and uh, what were that uh, story or fictional one that she say uh, sends to uh, some of her writings, some of her short novels were made into films, and uh, she is a very good writer. So all those short stories she had put under the title Yellow Notebook. So you can read a, a short story in the novel, The Golden Notebook. I hope you really understand the four notebooks and the free women in between. So the life of Anna and Molly goes on and what happens to them in England. Everything is narrated in free women, one, two, three, four chapters. So you can read all the free women, one, two, three, four uh, together, collect it from the book and uh, read together. You can read the red notebooks, all the red notebooks together, all the black notebooks together, blue notebooks together, yellow notebooks together. These are all separate, separate stories, but it is the story of one person. And it is that one person who had compartmentalized her life in this manner. These are all fragments. And these fragments, all these fragments together make Anna. And finally, there is the concluding chapter, which Doris Lessing names as the Golden Notebook. Your life is a series of fragments. And all these fragments make your life. And that life is the golden notebook. This is why I tell you that postmodernism is uh, one thing that uh, really emphasizes on fragmentation. And you will find a lot of other aspects of postmodernism too. And uh, again, uh, you find uh, the cultural moments of Raymond uh, Williams and also how this uh, uh, people try to take advantage of <clears throat> the people, the, uh, the uh, less uh, authoritative uh, people. And so there is the um, dominant cultural that is dominant emerging and the residual, what is left after. Then again, after 1848, it is uh, again another aspect What is uh, that is cultural moments which are dominant, emerging and residual. Dominant uh, in the sense uh, after 1848, emerging that is from 1890s onwards and the residual means that which remains that is from 1940s onwards. That is from 1848, then uh, that is the dominant, then uh, that is after 1848 is the dominant. Then emerging one is the one from 1890s. Then the residual is from 1940s. Jameson 
that is frederick jameson laments the loss of historical reality so this is why the historical reality is totally lost in the post modern uh, world then uh, the post modernist fiction <coughs> you will find that uh, brian mackhall is uh, the author that is chosen then post modernist fiction which is epistemological starting from the very beginning on then post modernism is ontological and uh, there is the <coughs> examples faulkner's absalom absalom and uh, it is an example for a uh, epistemological uh, novel uh, or the writing then again you find um, uh, samuel beckett's waiting for godo waiting for godo is uh, not a novel it is a drama and uh, you find that it is an absurd drama i think you must have heard of it or even uh, studied at least one absurd drama by harold pinter and samuel beckett is the one person who wrote waiting for godo in french and he uh, it was first published in french and then only it was published in english it is a play with uh, three acts and there is no change for the first scene second scene and the third scene except that there is a uh, tree <clears throat> and uh, the tree is a barren tree and then the branches come out towards the end and you find uh, two people just uh, uh, standing and uh, uh, exchanging dialogue nothing more and uh, two more people joins them they all sit what are they doing they are waiting for godo it's not god it's not uh, any person they have no idea who godo is but still they wait and uh, they have no idea who is when he will come or nothing but uh, you after reading the uh, drama you feel that um, there is absolutely nothing in the play and you wonder why you are there to see the uh, uh, performance or even uh, reading what is there and uh, the conversation that goes on it is uh, almost absurd means there is no meaning for connection there is no connection at all if you take a proper drama you will find that it is divided into five acts you have the beginning act there is uh, introduction type of uh, act prologue there is uh, the ending and uh, something or the other happens the other characters move around and scene change and uh, in act in the five acts you will find uh, it divided into several acts you have a you have studied shakespearean play you know how it is but for this there is nothing there is not even a change of dress there is not even a change of scenery so what are they waiting for they are waiting for godo and who is godo he, they don't know and uh, the audience also have no idea and suddenly the boy uh, a boy comes around uh, the fifth character comes around and says uh, godo is not coming today and then uh, they just uh, remain there because they have become that kind of persons people in the post modern world had become uh, people who think that there is uh, everything is uh, totally absurd because they have been through world war as i told you and the meaninglessness of life is that which had been uh, more imposed on their thought process and that thought process is being dramatized by samuel beckett through the play waiting for godo and then again you have the other writers like uh, alan gob grille and uh, uh, uh alan uh, rob grille and vladimir nabko then robert kuwer thomas pinjian these are all ontological uh, for all these writers ontological is the dominant and it's not epistemological because um, the root cause it is uh, the naturally they change or they try to find something or some kind of meaning in life and so the writers focus their ideas uh, differently and even in literature also it is totally different they know that there is going going to be no conclusion they have no idea what their life is going to be there is total uncertainty about life and they are living in that uh, period also and i think you will be understanding this you have a feeling that a time will come when this covid days will go and you will be able to function uh, properly uh, as before that kind of hope is there for us but for the people who had been through the world war there was no absolutely no hope and so out of this comes 
the not despair but the absurdity of the life and building up a lot of things and uh, amassing wealth all this becomes totally meaningless to them and there is also the meaninglessness to certain actions that are there in life then another feature of postmodernism is the temporal disorder historiographic metafiction a blending of history and fantasy example tin drum by ganda grass midnight children by salman rushdi and he is an indian and midnight children is about a child who was born on the on the midnight of uh, uh, 1947 August 15th i hope the day is significant enough for you and what happens to that child and it is uh, uh, it is uh, as if he is writing the history of india through the life of that child it's a book worth reading and it's a must read book for all indians and uh, you will find uh, translations of the same thing and uh, it's worth reading okay so you find histor- historiographic meta fiction that is a blending of history and fantasy and we know that the history part is there which is true fantasy part is salman rushdie's own contribution but he had mingled both history and fantasy in such a manner that it comes out as a really amazing work that is there is no other word for that tin drum is again another work worth reading it is something that you will understand and uh, if the book is available you can read that also it's by ganda grass fragmentation of the narrators you will find this uh, fragmentation of the narrators emphasized in the book by john fowles it is called the french lieutenant's woman published in the year 1979 which has got uh, uh, multiple endings not beginnings i'm sorry it has uh, multiple endings and uh, you will find that uh, the french lieutenant's woman is a misnomer and moreover he had published the book in 1979 but the book or the milieu of the book is actually victorian england or towards the end of victorian england and uh, you will find uh, the rossettis coming up and again the uh, uh, industrial revolution all these were uh, placed there and you find three endings for this particular novel it's an option that is left to you you can choose any one of them and so uh, it is uh, uh, multiple endings not beginnings mul- multiple endings so again you find magic realism another feature of uh, postmodernism and then again uh, some of the narratives are metafictional metafictional means fiction on fiction that is again uh, a, uh, metafictional you will find a perfect example in certain films that is fiction on fiction it is that kind of writing if you check certain films you will find a perfect example for meta fiction a person writing a story actually it is his own story he acts out that story so in his novel also a story parallel story going on and a conclusion for both uh, the novel and his own uh, life story that you will find uh, in certain films then writing about writing meta writing or meta fiction is fiction on fiction and then that is about writing about writing that is again also that's uh, again also another type of uh, another feature of postmodernism and then you have six points from beginning theory peter barry's beginning theory is something that you have to uh, take into serious consideration because everything is taken from there so you have six points which you can read elaborately and understand based on these slides you will find it in page 162 and 163 and you will also find a chart in page 163 which will help you to place all this in the right perspective so that is the way to study something and to understand everything to understand whatever that we have been talking on and sometimes you will find a clash or even um, um, something coming up repeatedly and uh, uh, it is because uh, all these are interconnected some of these are interconnected and uh, that connection is uh, emphasized and i think i have uh, really connected it to uh, the ones that we have spoken earlier 
and so you naturally you'll have to refer to the earlier lessons in case it is necessary and in your text you will find that elaboration sometimes you don't find certain things elaborated in this chapter because uh, it is being elaborate it was uh, elaborated earlier and when you refer to those uh, particular lessons you will find them in uh, elaborate form like althusa and also raymond williams and his theory uh, and his cultural materialism everything is there cultural studies under the title you will find that so uh, beginning theory will give you six more points about postmodernism and also a summary of what we have learned um, through all these so postmodernism and uh, example is ridley scott's blade runner is a novel and it uses pastiches and uh, creative uh, what is pastiche a creative work that imitates another author or uh, genre another author or genre but uh, why is it uh, uh, imitated that is again a question you will find a certain book being copied and you find that uh, it is taken out of that context and it is being imitated by the uh, people and so naturally it is something that uh, uh, that is uh, taken out of context and used in the present uh, context then in uh, the next topic is eco criticism it is the study of the relationship between literate and the physical environment and it is interdisciplinary how environment is represented in literature and how the human treats the non human examines possible solutions for the current environmental crisis in america you they use the term eco criticism in uk they use the term uh, green studies it's a relationship between literature and the physical environment and naturally it is interdisciplinary you find the uh, rachel carson's book silent spring published in the year 1962 which is a wake up call for action the bhopal uh, gas uh, disaster which you are aware of from india the chernobyl radiations le and leakage and the endosulfan tragedy from especially from uh, kerala all these are things which brought to our mind brought to the forefront eco criticism or study of the environment and uh, uh, rachel carson silent spring is indeed the one book that uh, brought in an awareness of uh, the environment and the deeper implications of the same thing then in connect connection to that you have deep ecology and spiritualism part of deep ecology is emotional responses to nature and its key elements emotional responses to nature and the key elements you uh, which you find uh, uh, you find eight key points in that in the page 165 and 166 it is good to go through it i think you you will know all these you have been going through this for a long long time in your schools and in all the lessons and the emotional responses to nature there is a deep awareness of en the environment and uh, the human part of uh, protecting the environment the the, the uh, need to protect the environment it is being emphasized at each and every point every moment in our life wherever you turn either in the news or in the newspaper or in the films or whatever it is you will find something or the other connected to nature and why it is necessary to protect that the name that is worth mentioning is toro he is an american and he had written a book called walden the the this is the name of a book and it is also the name of the place that he uh, lived in and why is he call uh, why does he call it calls it walden it is almost a forest like environment and he had let it grow as it is he had lost he is uh, quite uh, uh, comfortable living there and he has okay uh, uh, for company the uh, the birds and also the animals and the trees and he is perfectly uh, happy there and people came over to him he is a person who writes uh, uh, well 
and uh, his friend came over emerson came over and asked him toro why are you there why are you living here in walden in this forest all away, away from civilization and toro immediately asked him emerson why are you there out there in the world the world is actually here so he emphasizes environmentalism and anthropocentrism and uh, he says third world environmentalism so uh, all these are connected and in the third world environmentalism you will find the names like ramchandra guha and juan martinus alier these are the names that are connected to third world environmentalism so walden is thoros a uh, life proven he knew that it is possible to live in communion with the nature he proves that in the very modern world it is possible and he is one person who speaks about environmentalism and anthropocentrism or that is the uh, place of uh, uh, human beings as a center of this universe eco critical literary criticism focuses on uh, a lot of things that is uh, they try to see how literature portrays uh, ecology and uh, how it uh, moves on without scant regard to the environment all these eco critic eco critical uh, literary criticism focuses on examples are walden in the american literature shagundalam of course in indian literature and why is it important because you find shagundala living in an ashram where she communes with the animals the deer and also the other animals and it is the the environment that a peop that people can really believe in without hurting it but being there with the animals and not hurting them not disturbing their environment letting them be the dominant people and we the humans are just uh, people who encroach their peace and uh, there in shagundalam they are trying not to be the people who encroach but who are living along with the uh, along uh, with the communion of nature and uh, with the animals of nature then the major uh, engagements of eco criticism you will find five points which you will find in page 170 maybe it is a summary of what we have been what i have been telling you all these uh, in all these slides okay there is also another thing called eco feminism along with eco criticism there is eco feminism it's a term coined by french feminist francois de aubon in 1974 it is the connection between women and nature man is always equated with culture and women with nature it is always mother nature it is not father nature nobody ever says father nature you have mother tongue you have you don't have a father tongue because this is how it is fashioned you have also mother nature and you will never ever come across father nature so that even in the terminology itself there is indeed mother and as such it is equated to women and i have put in a picture here which is actually a picture of the chipko movement from india it is like embracing the trees it is from the eco feminism started in or it became very form uh, it became popular in india these women uh, as you see in the picture they tried to protect the tree which is symbolic of their protecting the environment especially the trees and uh, trees that gives you shade and the trees that will provide you with a lot of sustaining uh, things and uh, your life itself and they have undertaken the role of protecting them because a woman is always connected to nature and it is she who nurtures life and as such she knows the value of life and life cannot be there if you don't have a nature and or your environment is not protected if it is not protected there will be no life and she is a woman is indeed uh, caring for her future generation by protecting the environment and this way of standing together is the way they try to show their um, affinity towards uh, environment and also towards uh, ecology and this is a historical moment and you can read about it in uh, internet or uh, any other book which is available 
it is classified into two groups again radical and cultural as in feminism you will find uh, even in eco feminism radical and cultural group the first point is uh, patriarchal society equates nature and women to degrade them not to appreciate it appreciate them but it is a reaction against this so uh, radical uh, eco feminism is uh, a reaction against the patriarchal society which equates nature and women to degrade them then uh, association of women and the environment it is uh, intimate and organic relationship between them so here you find that the association of women and environment it is intimate and it is a kind of organic relationship there is a kind of organic relationship you don't need any by any one to mediate between them they are part of the environment so again you f- find cultural feminism cultural eco feminism and uh, which has its roots in nature based religions goddess nature worship etc nature based religions goddess and nature you find in kerala you will find a lot of sarpa kavugal and what is happening there it is the kava is protected and nobody will go over there the nobody will ever dare to cut a tree from that place because it is sacred and so uh, a religion that uh, protects uh, uh, that uh, protects nature in this manner is indeed part of cultural eco feminism and even goddesses also who are dominant and uh, it is uh, uh, it is uh, the goddesses who dominate this uh, kaugal and uh, um, naturally this is a uh, part of eco feminism and also nature worship sometimes and this is why you find the radical and cultural part of eco feminism and how it goes on in uh, in this present era eco feminism in 1993 was by uh, maria mais and vandana shiva vandana shiva from india and the main claim uh, is the binary opposition that is the binary opposition is uh, heaven and earth mind and body male and female human and animal spirit and matter culture and nature white and non white so you find all these binary opposition heaven and earth mind and body all these are totally uh, opposing male and female okay you find all this opposition human and animal spirit and matter culture and nature white and non white all these are the binary oppositions and maria mais and vandana shiva uh, responds to that and comes to uh, go th- uh, goes along with this opposition and studies them in detail then legitimizing these binaries through religious and scientific uh, constructs then some new branches of eco feminism you will find here that is these binaries are legitimized through religious and scientific constructs how religion constrains them and how it is possible to have uh, the opposition not too much but at the same time uh, accepting these binaries then some new branches of eco feminism like for example being vegetarian i think therefore i am vegan so that uh, that it's a kind of slogan which has been going on and you will find that the western world which has been totally non vegetarian some of them had become totally vegetarian much more vegetarian than we indians some of our uh, indians are uh, vegetarians we are, we are so proud of that fact but the um, western world had accepted vegetarian uh, food or vegetarian life even uh, and uh, the slogan is i think therefore i am vegan materialist is uh, labor power and property and spiritualist is a return to myth and theology all these are the different branches of eco feminism all these are labor is necessary power is necessary property is also necessary these are branded as materialist spiritualist means a return to myth and theology vandana shiva in staying alive glorifies the vedic period of indian history for the emphasis on symbiotic values so he glorifies the vedic period where people were living in communion with the nature and there was uh, much respect for uh, the persons and uh, she is 
uh, taking that part of Indian history and emphasizes on the symbiotic values uh, that uh, they had at that time. And in a way, this is a summing up of all the theories that you have studied. So all these theories, if you are an eco-feminist, if you are a person who uh, has concern for environment, naturally you will forego all those barriers that had been keeping you from another human being. You will be able to see another person not based on caste or being marginalized or downtrodden, but as a human being, a fellow human being. And it is in this sense, all these cultural theories will help you to develop your notions of the world, uh, the notions about this world. And I hope you will have a good time going through all this. And thank you once again. Go through all these slides carefully. Understand it properly. And uh, revise it well for your examination. Thank you. We'll meet again in the next semester. Thank you once again.